future president that we all know here, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm in the cosmetic, cosmetic products in, uh, in France. Uh, 20, 22 years ago, with the wood of uh, Tangi. Uh, it's a, a, a millennial uh, tradition from Burma. And uh, we did it in, in France 22 years ago. And uh, we, at that time, uh, my, the company where I went, a pharmaceutical, French pharmaceutical group, uh, bought the wood from Tangi and they make all the profit in, uh, in France and Swiss. And uh, next year we do it in Burma with the same product that the Burmans use for a thousand years and uh, we will share everything, all the profits with Burma's people. Thank you. Anybody else? So good morning everybody. Uh, our dear host, Professor Chagan, he will be with us later today and uh, greet us all. Uh, but now I would like to introduce you to Garrett. And uh, Garrett will uh, say who he is first and explain a little bit and then uh, welcome us to an amazing, amazing schedule today. Thank you. So my name is Garrett Austin and I am wearing many hats today because I'm not only giving the first presentation, but I'm also moderating the other presentations. So I hope that you will excuse me if I need, I have my, everything I want to say is, is typed out here, but I might need to, to look at my notes a couple times. Uh, I want to say thank you all for coming and I'm very grateful that this full day of presentations and discussions is being presented as part of the Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies Conference at Chiang Mai University because I think it's appropriate that a day of this conference is being devoted to, to Burma and its people. I thought a bit about what, what dignity means. I'm not a member of your, of your network, uh, but I thought about what does living with dignity mean and what could it mean in terms of Burma since a whole day of the conference is being devoted to the situation in Burma. And I think that to me, living with dignity means the empowerment that comes from believing that we and our individual opinions and aspirations are worthy of being acknowledged by, by others in our society and also respected and realized. And in order to live with dignity, people need to be unafraid of being penalized, imprisoned, or maltreated for expressing their thoughts and desires. Burma is a country where people have had to struggle against tremendously daunting obstacles to claim their dignity for over five decades. And just now, in the past couple of years, we've been beginning to see people across the country starting to reclaim and demand their dignity, and, and it's been very encouraging. So my name, as I said, is Garrett, and I am the director of the Burma Study Center here in Chiang Mai, and I also work part-time at the Faculty of Social Sciences with Ajahn Cheyan at Chiang Mai University. Uh, I consider myself more than an academic, I consider myself an activist and an advocate for peace, stability, sustainable development, and an end to human rights abuses for all the people in Burma. I primarily work for these goals through information dissemination and awareness raising with members of the international community like yourselves, and also education and capacity building with people from Burma. I've been with the Burma Study Center since 2010, and our programs mainly fall under three main topics. The first is education for people from Burma. We offer free English and computer classes for, for migrants in Chiang Mai. And we also operate a large lending library of materials, books, research reports, and documentary films about Burma and Southeast Asia for academics and journalists and anybody who's interested in learning more. And then we also organize and participate in community events, such as, such as the conference today. So, to begin with, I, I am not sure how much, I, I think some of you know quite a lot about Burma, and so you can uh, just 
be patient for a couple minutes of introduction, and others of you, I think, might not know much. So I would just like to give a brief overview of the past couple of years to where we, how we've gotten to where we are today with the situation in the country. Here is a, a pretty good map that shows you that Burma is in geopolitically a very strategic location right between India and China, two of the most populous countries in the world. And a large portion of the country opens to the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean. So this, this helps us understand why after being closed off to much of the outside world for 50 years, the international community has really embraced the recent opening up in Burma. And you can see how the southeastern part of the country borders northern Thailand, where we are today. So, brief background. Right after the, Burma was a colony of England until the end of World War II. And after it gained its independence, there was a brief period, about 15 years, of parliamentary democracy. But in 1962, the military of the country staged a coup and took over and held on to the reins of power for, for pretty much the next five decades. From 1962 to 2010, the country was ruled directly by a brutal military dictatorship. In 2010, there were elections that, that many of us in the academic and activist community were very doubtful about, about whether these elections could really bring about any meaningful change or progress in the country, uh, mainly because of the flawed 2008 constitution, which guaranteed 25% of the seats in parliament to members of the military, and also clauses in the constitution that made uh, it, for any amendments to the Constitution to be made, there, needed to, there needs to be a supermajority of 75% uh, to have any of, of parliamentarians for any amendments to be made. So this makes it very difficult without the cooperation of the military to get anything changed in the, in the Constitution. And also because after the election, we saw that the vast majority of the people in the upper ranks of the government are from the military or ex-military men, such as ex-general and now President Ben Singh. But there have been actually more, many meaningful changes, many encouraging signs that, that Burma is uh, on a, 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 maybe a rocky road, but, but on a road of some reform with some improvements in the country. Starting in just, just six days after the elections at the end of 2010, Aung San Suu Kyi was released from house arrest where she'd been kept for a total of 15 years after uh, becoming the, the leader of the National League for Democracy but, and winning, actually her party winning the election in 1990 but never being allowed to take office. In, so in 2011, the international community started embracing Burma and we saw more and more trips of foreign leaders to Burma and Burma's leaders such as Aung San Suu Kyi and President Ben Sein visiting, uh, visiting other countries. This seemed to signify a, a, a big change in the, in the dynamics. So for my presentation today, I've called it Update from Burma. And I would, just to give you a little bit of background about where I'm coming from, uh, my, the framework for my presentation today, most of the information, the images, and some of the quotes that I'm going to be sharing with you is uh, information that I collected on my recent trip to Burma in January and February of this year. In 2010 was the last time I had been able to travel throughout the country, and I was deported and blacklisted, so I was unable to, to travel in the country. They didn't, uh, at that time, take kindly to, to self-proclaimed activists for human rights. Um, I was de-blacklisted in 2013, and then I had my first opportunity to travel throughout the country again earlier this year. Uh, so basically, in a nutshell, what I found was that there, there, is, there has been impressive progress and many, many positive changes in the country, but also many obstacles and, and uh, problems remaining and, and some new problems that, that Burma is experiencing. Um, what I thought would be most interesting for this presentation today is to share the opinions as much as I can from people inside the country about what they think 
about the, the changes that their country has seen in the past couple of years. What has improved, what has worsened, or what's stayed the same since the 2010 elections and the, the reform era for the new, the new Myanmar? Um, and I thought that this could be helpful because it's, it's often quite difficult to make sense and to reconcile all the different opinions and views that we, that we can read and hear about the country through the activist and exile organizations, a lot of which are based here in Chiang Mai, from the new government in Burma itself, and also international governments and corporations that have different interests and, and different reasons to, to believe the situation is what it is. So I thought it would be most interesting to share with you directly what I noticed and what I, what I found during my trip to the country. So I'd like to think of myself as an optimistic person, which when I began my interest in Burma and my, my current work, it was always a challenge to be optimistic about the situation in Burma. But thankfully, I feel now, finally, it, we can allow ourselves some, some optimism. So I'd like to begin the presentation by going over some of the positives that I, that I noted and, and uh, found out about during my recent trip. Including one of the biggest differences is the space for NGOs and civil society groups in the country to operate free, freely with, with, uh, without fear of persecution. And I was told by a young community leader that I met in Shan State, he said, before we could not even have meetings in our village to discuss basic subjects affecting our daily lives. We could be arrested if we did that. But now it's no problem to organize meetings, classes, and workshops about all kinds of issues. NGOs from outside can come to teach us and help us openly. So this was this is regarded as as significant, a significant opening of the country and, and space for civil society. And I think it makes a big difference in encouraging young people inside the country that, that they are supported by, by, by the rest of the world in realizing their aspirations. Also, uh, it, what I noticed personally from 2010 to 2014 was, was a big difference in infrastructure which um, Reinhardt, who just recently came back from this trip, also noted. It's, it's much easier now for, for outsiders to travel in Burma with uh, improved in infrastructure such as banking, telecommunications, and, and transportation. There's more links to the country and also inside the country. Because of international sanctions that were meant to, to punish or coerce the, the military dictatorship to reform, Prior to 2010, uh, it, there were no there were no international banks operating inside the country, and visas and Mastercards could not be used, and tourists had were expected to enter the country with all the money that they were planning to need during their trip, and this this caused a lot of difficulties. Obviously, now Western Union can be seen even in small towns, and uh, credit cards can be used quite easily, and this has made it much easier for for tourists. And uh, telecommunications, Burma is still one of the countries with the lowest penetration rates for, for the internet and for mobile phone usage. But the fact is, is, is that now you, it is possible to get online a lot more. And this is empowering for the people and helps them feel like there's more of a link to, to the outside world. Um, it's, there's still hurdles such as, you know, you, you can go to a public library and they, they have a big sign advertising free Wi-Fi, but they don't have any computers for the public to use. It's expected that, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to have your own device, which still means that it's, it's limited to people who are already in the upper, upper realms of, of uh, prosperity, but, but change, change is there. There's also a lot of uh, exiled media websites that previously were blocked in the country are now freely accessible. So this is encouraging. And this, this picture here, uh, and, and the next one actually, what I noticed is also an increased tolerance of ethnic symbolism uh, and language, ethnic languages being taught and being allowed to be taught in schools and ethnic media and organizations operating freely. Um, previously, you, it, it was very rare to see, I, I, 
I forgot to mention, but I'm sure most of you know, Burma is one of the most uh, ethnically diverse countries in the world. But the, the majority population, the Burmans, have historically uh, had nationalistic policies that have tended to to oppress the ethnic minorities and uh, dissuade them from from sh showing their their ethnicity or practicing their their traditional culture. Um, Previously, it was quite quite rare to travel to ethnic areas and actually see see symbols and uh, signs that that sh that showed you that these were ethnic people that were proud of their their ethnicity and their culture. This time in 2014, I saw a lot more of that. For example, traveling in Shan State, I saw a lot more Shan flags on the front of buildings or on people's clothes. In businesses, it's, it's now allowed and people are, are probably taking the opportunity to have things printed in their own ethnic language as well as Burmese. It's also being discussed after a long policy of, of forcing a Burmese language to be the main language of instruction or the only language of instruction at schools throughout the country. It's now, there's, it's now uh, being discussed to allow ethnic languages to be taught. And also, we can see things like uh, ethnic leaders from the past who, who uh, the history was pretty much attempted, the, the military regime attempted to erase the history. It's now being allowed to, to discuss it again. So this picture on the end is one of the, or he is the, the last Shan prince for Sipa in northern Shan state. And uh, he was actually arrested and, and killed following the military coup in 1962. And it was, it, it would have been something that uh, could have landed you in prison if you dared to put a picture of, of your last prince up on your wall in Shan State. But in, I, I found this framed photo of the prince and his wife, uh, it displayed in the lobby of a guest house in northern Shan State. And so, so this was this was very encouraging. Also, much more press freedom and, and ostensibly less censorship. Uh, so this image here represents that. And previously, before 2012, the only daily newspaper that was allowed to be published in the country was belonged to the military regime. It was called the New Light of Myanmar. And in 2012, the media reforms really started progressing, and now it is allowed for privately owned journals and newspapers to print on a daily basis. There is the, the requirement that every anything that's uh, printed in the country needs to go through the press scrutiny board or the censorship board has been abolished, although there's it's still in its nascent stages of press freedom and with uh, a lot of evidence of journalists and journals self-censoring because they're not quite sure or not quite confident about what could could cause problems for them. Uh, but as a, a uh, example of the free media as an important tool for empowerment and a, an essential component of checks and balances against those in power uh, was was uh, related to me from a tri shop driver in Mandalay who he showed me his his national ID card, which lists his occupation as tri shop driver. And he explained to me that he used to experience a lot of discrimination when he was, when his ID was checked, because the, the local authorities or the police would be able to tell that he was a tri shop driver and they regarded his, him as someone, you know, very low class and uneducated. And, but he explained to me, before, the police always treated people very badly if they know we are poor or uneducated. Sit down, shut up, you are nothing. But now they are afraid of the news and the social media, so it's a little better. If they treated us cruelly, we can make a problem for them by speaking out in the media. So this, is, this was encouraging, that the people are starting to feel like they do have some recourse if they experience discrimination. There have been examples of parliamentarians uh, disrespecting local villagers and that the villagers talk to a reporter and, and actually something is done, the, uh, the, the authority is castigated. Um, so this also obviously relates back to the improved telecommunications infrastructure. There's uh, 
that the Facebook and email usage in Burma has increased dramatically in the past couple of years, and people are using it to to take a stand for their their deserving of, uh, of human dignity. And but I want to to add a caveat to this point about about press freedom. Uh, one a very a very so I, overall, I was impressed with the media that I observed in the country. I saw local journals that had editorials calling for the recognition of the aspirations of ethnic people and calling on the government to increase the, uh, the efforts to reduce human rights abuses in the country. But I was only able to make a very limited sampling and obviously only the English language media in the country. And there's also examples of the media actually uh, I would say abusing their, their press freedom and, and leading to other problems that I'll get to that I'll get to a little bit later. So continuing with the positives, at one point prior to 2010, Burma was the country with the highest number of political prisoners in the world, with about 2,200. Today, the vast majority of them have been released. There's still there's still about 20 or 25 political prisoners counted by by organizations, but this has this has been very encouraging that the majority have been released. Also, uh, it's no, there's a noticeable tolerance for ethnic opposition and pro-democracy parties and organizations to operate freely in the country. Previously, most of these would have been outlawed and people that attended secret meetings would have, would have had to fear for their safety. Um, without even trying, I stumbled upon two large gatherings of ethnic political parties uh, one in Shan State and one in Kachin State during my trip. This this uh, meeting in, in Shan State was for the Shan Nationalities League for Democracy, and the main speaker was Kun Tun Wu, who was a political prisoner himself after winning the, the election in 1990 and never being allowed to serve. He was released shortly after Aung San Suu Kyi, and he's now able to, to travel freely throughout the country and to, to uh, attempt to raise support for his party. They were not able to run in the 2010 elections, but, but they will be in 2015. And this picture on the other side was a, an even larger gathering in Medina in Kachin State. And uh, this was, I was in Medina on Kachin Union Day. And this, uh, I, I'm not able to understand Kachin language or to, to understand too much of what they were talking about, but I could understand the acronyms and they were talking freely about NGOs and the UN and uh, a lot of ethnic regalia was on display. People were, were proudly supporting the, the Kachin Independence Organization. So this, this uh, all points to, to something that I would call a, a change in atmosphere, which sometimes change in atmosphere, that term has been used to describe the reforms in Burma derisively, but I think that, it's, that uh, it is an important thing to consider that when there is less fear and the atmosphere overall has become more positive for people feeling more free and less afraid this this does encourage more more change and uh, and and people encourages people to take advantage of their freedom of expression even if they're not quite sure what the limits are on that freedom but they're they're not waiting for for it to be defined they're um, actually taking advantage and and sticking their necks out uh, very, very early on in the process, and I was encouraged about that. I spoke to a monk, a Buddhist monk in Bokoku, in Magwe Division, and this this was the, uh, he actually lives at the monastery that was one of the first monasteries where the monks gathered and marched in 2007 for the Safran Revolution, the pro-democracy uprising. And he spoke about the, the, the change in atmosphere by telling me this. He said, I can say now that our people are not afraid to raise our heads up and open our mouths. Before, we were afraid of having our heads cut off if we did that. We could not speak for so long, but we are ready to be free and brave now. We are not afraid to give our opinions and say what we think. We cannot go back to the way we were before. And I asked this monk, who did march in 2007 against the military government, I asked him if he thought that the monks would ever rise up or, or have reason to, to march against the government again in Burma. And he told me, we will if we need to. 
And uh, obviously this is an activist monk who's, who's taken proactive measures before, but he, he seemed to feel that it wasn't just him or the, the monks at his monastery, it was people throughout the country would not, would not submit again to the dictatorship that they lived under for so many years. So moving on to the negatives, some of the problems that we've seen get worse since the reform process started, and also some new new problems. I was, uh, I think, you know, it's it's pretty much common knowledge that on one hand, when you have development of a country, there's also the the devolution of the environment in many cases, and this is certainly very easy to notice th uh, throughout the areas in Burma where, where development projects are taking place. Um, the, the main problem which, which Alex is going to go into in his presentation also is that uh, the majority of the, or, or all of the development projects in Burma are, are done with very little input from the local people who are affected by the projects in their area, and with them receiving very little of the benefits from that the projects generate. Also, uh, no EIA. EIA is Environmental Impact Assessment. That's a completely foreign concept in Burma, and um, and unfortunately, it's not. Uh, our EIAs are not being done before before mega projects are being committed to between the government on the on the national level and and international partners, and very little consultation, as I as I mentioned, with local villagers. So besides environmental devastation of the areas where these projects are being built, such as land mine, or so not land mines, but um, mining, uh, resource extraction mines and, and dams, uh, there's also been everywhere where these kind of projects are being implemented, we've also seen land confiscation and displacement of the people in the areas. And, uh, this is continuing despite suspensions. In 2011, the, either 2011 or 2012, President Ben Sain announced that he would suspend the Mitsong Dam, which was planned to take, planned to uh, be built in northern Burma and Kachin State. And it was this was considered significant at the time because it was the first example of a leader of the country actually being responsive to the demands of the people. Uh, people throughout the country demonstrated against the building of the dam and received a reprieve when the president announced that the dam would be suspended. But when I traveled to Mitsong in January, uh, my guide pointed out this on the on the left are the is sort of the the mock-up for for what the dam would look like when it's finished, and it would it would flood an enormous area and. All of the all of the villagers who lived in this area have been relocated. They were relocated in 2010, uh, and I passed by one of the villages, one of the relocation villages, and it, it, you can see that the houses don't look too bad, but the, the land is just barren. There was no regard given for helping these people uh, build new farms or or reinstate their their methods of, of uh, earning a livelihood, and I also. Uh, encountered a lot of cynicism about what exactly this means, a suspension of the dam project. I was told by a villager in, in one of these relocated villages, they haven't changed their minds. They are just waiting for us to forget, to cool down. They are still just thinking about how to get money for themselves, not about what we want or what is good for our country. If they really were not planning to do the dam in the future, we would be able to move back to our land. The, so the, the people in these relocated villages would like to go back to their original, uh, original uh, villages, but there's, there's, you, can, you can drive through where people have been relocated from and there's still signs that say nobody's allowed in this area and uh, it's, it's, they're like ghost towns with just empty, now decaying, uh, homes and, and businesses. So it's yeah, it raises a big question of uh, what what's the significance of suspending a dam operation rather than just canceling it. So it's, we'll have to see. Uh, this is in Shan State. This was uh, inter this is near uh, Jiaomei and Sipa in northern Shan State, and this was 
was sad for me to see because this is the area where the Shui, the Shui gas pipeline is laid under the ground. And uh, it is an enormous gas and oil pipeline that extends from, from western Burma in the Bay of Bengal all the way to southern China. So it just bisects the entire country. And this is a, a project that a lot of us in the activist community in Chiang Mai uh, campaigned against in 2011 and 2012 and even 2013, but now it's, it's a reality. And so it was sad for me to, to actually see the evidence. Uh, with the background image, you can see, you know, it looks like still a, a nice idyllic farmland, but when you, when you look closer in these areas, you see the, the signposts that show you where the pipeline is under the ground and how far down. This is the Myanmar-China gas pipeline project here. Um, and, and you see signs like this all around. This sign says, Pipeline facilities protected under law, severe punishment on pipeline destruction. And it was also a little bit odd because there's so many of these signs that warn you against even thinking about uh, tampering with the pipeline, but they're only in English. There's, there's no signs like this in Burmese or Shan or Chinese as if they expect the only, the only people audacious enough to, to attempt to destroy the pipeline would be pesky Westerners. Um, but I also, I was told by, by, by a young man who was attempting to, to teach, he actually studied here in Thailand with an environmental organization, and he's since gone home to Shan State, he's trying to teach other people in his village about the importance of environmental conversation, conservation. Uh, he, he talked to me about the pipeline, and this is what he said. We had no say about this project as it was decided by the military, and we know we will not get any benefits from the pipeline. They came onto our land and destroyed our farms, but we couldn't say anything. They gave us some compensation, but not enough, and we can't complain. Now some farmers' crops still won't grow over the pipeline, and we are worried that the pipeline might leak. So this, uh, made me realize that, that compensation is a big issue. Actually, I was told that in the, in the area where, you know, where the pipeline has been laid, and every farm that was dug up while they were laying the pipeline, the farmers received compensation for one crop cycle. Uh, but as this, as this young man told me, there's, even though the, the pipeline is, is under the ground, the, some of the farmers are having difficulties getting their crops to grow over it. And uh, there, is no, there is no talk of compensation for farmers who's, who are having to change their, their crops. Um, and, and, and also there is yeah, concern, as I, as I noted, about the, the integrity of the pipeline, which was laid by a, a Chinese company. And if, you know, we've seen examples all over the world of, of pipelines cracking or breaking, and the farmers are worried that if this occurs, in their on their land, that they would have no recourse, nobody, no no compensation if that were to happen. So I put this slide in to to talk a little bit about the huge disparity that is evident if you travel outside of the the handful of, of large cities in Burma and go into the countryside and, and the ethnic areas. Uh, so this picture in the background is Sule Pagoda Road in downtown Rangoon. And yeah, we can see this looks like a, a pretty reasonable functioning city um, with, with all the modern conveniences and services. But the, the inset photo is in a Palong village in eastern Burma. And actually, the, the conditions in the vast majority of the country are much more similar to what we see in this small picture. No signs of development, uh, very, very few signs of, of education going on. Uh, very little evidence of any of the benefits from the reforms actually trickling down to the people who are still living in poverty. And uh, it's, I think that, you know, somebody told me, well, this is, when I, when I did this presentation previously, somebody mentioned, well, there's always a disparity between the major urban areas and, and the rural areas in every country. Burma's not unique in that. But I think that it's important to keep in mind that how, how, huge the disparity is throughout the country. And also because for the vast majority of 
politicians and tourists and international business people, when they travel to Burma, they often only go to the major cities. So it's important to, to remember that the vast majority of the country is not like what you encounter there. And a note on the economy, uh, these are just the facts. Burma is still the second poorest country in all of Asia after Afghanistan. And it's also the poorest member of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, of which it's the chair this year. Burma contributes only 0.2% of total production in mainland Southeast Asia. And this is despite the fact that it's, that it's seen a huge increase in international investment and in the lifting of economic sanctions in the past couple of years. And it's become much more attractive to, to foreign investors. It's always had a lot of resources, but now there's, there's less prohibitions against inter, uh, foreign investors going in and, and exploiting those. Um, just recently, the World Bank ranked Burma number 182 out of 189 countries for ease of doing business and lack of corruption. So this is obviously still a major obstacle. So I was also told about the, the perceived increase in drug use and drug trafficking and drug production throughout the country since the, since the current government took, took power. Uh, this is something I'm, I haven't been able to get a lot of hard facts or research about, but the, the uh, perception is that there has, there has been an increase in, in drug use in areas that, that uh, previously did not experience such problems. And it has been reported that there was an overall increase in opium production for 2012 and 2013. A lot of uh, villagers in Shan State told me that they believe that permits have been given to, to opium farmers in exchange for, basically for, for uh, vote buying. Um, politicians going in and saying, if you vote for me, I will allow you to, to continue producing opium for as long as I'm in office. Um, so this is, this is, Burma has always been one of the countries that's been the largest producers of opium, again, after Afghanistan. But it's a concern that we're seeing problems in areas that previously didn't have such problems. And another point that Alex is going to cover in his presentation is about, about ceasefires and the peace process. But the, the point I want to make briefly is that it is true that ceasefires have been signed with a majority of the ethnic armed groups and, and the national military. But what this means on the ground is that there have been more Burmese soldiers available to fight in the hot spots and, and pressure the groups that haven't agreed to ceasefires. And a university student that I spoke to in Kachin State said, now we have more problems with soldiers than before because they are fighting the Kachin army but not other armies. It is worse for us now. Everywhere there are Burmese soldiers, there are problems. And also I mentioned that I would get back to press freedom and, and media freedom. And uh, we've seen that it's, it's not exactly clear how much freedom is being given to the press and to the journalists inside the country. And while I was there, there was the, the case with a journal called the Unity Journal, where a, the, the journal published reports of a secret chemical weapons factory in Mogwe Division in, in Western Burma, and uh, that, that the government did not want to acknowledge or, or be reported about, especially on the brink of it signing several international uh, non-proliferation agreements.
government. So my, I, I employed an, an unlicensed tour guide in Mandalay, and he explained that he would like to express this to people who are planning on visiting the country. He said, people should only travel on their own if they want to help us. That's the only way we can earn any money. When tourists come in a group, all of the money only goes to the big hotels and restaurants with owners that are already rich. The government's tour office makes all the plans for them and gives the business to their friends, not the local people. So I want to encourage you that if you are inspired to visit Burma soon, please consider doing so on your, on your own, uh, on a privately arranged trip. You'll, you'll definitely experience a few more difficulties and some frustrations, but you'll also have much more contact with the local people, and the money that you spend will do much more to help the, the people that really need to, to benefit from the, the increase in tourism. So uh, this is the, the last negative that I want to talk about, but it's probably the most significant. Uh, most of you are probably aware of the, the Rohingya crisis and the, the overall increase in anti-Muslim sentiment that we've seen throughout the country. This really exploded in 2012 in Arakan State, in western Burma, between the, the majority Buddhist population and one Muslim minority called the Rohingya, who are not considered by, by the majority of the population to be uh, to be a legitimate ethnic group of the country. They're considered illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, even though they've been living in the country for many generations. Alarmingly, after 2012, when things really flared up in Western Burma, the, the anti-Muslim violence started spreading throughout the entire country, and it wasn't only targeting the Rohingya group, but, but all Muslims in the country together. And this was largely fueled by a group of extremist monks known as the 969 movement who have nationalist sentiments and, and uh, call for things such as the boycotting of all Muslim businesses throughout the country and the uh, removal of, of Muslims from the general population and being, being put in basically concentration camps. Uh, and, and also calling for, for laws to further restrict the, the liberties of Muslims and Rohingyas in the country. Uh, so altogether since 2012, more than 250 people have been killed and 130,000 people have been displaced. And although it's, it's not always, we can't put all the blame on the, on the Burman or the Buddhist majority, the vast majority of, of victims in this conflict have been Muslims, that's, that's a fact. And in just the past months, in just the past couple of weeks, actually, we've seen some developments that have not been encouraging at all. Uh, Medicine Sans Frontiers, which I'm sure one of our French friends would be able to pronounce better than me, but they, they, in English it's called Doctors Without Borders. They were forced to suspend all of their operations throughout the entire country because the government, uh, the local authorities in Archon State complained that Doctors Without Borders was, was showing preferential treatment towards Muslims, doing more to care for, for Muslim, Muslim villagers in need of, of uh, medical assistance, which I think is, is understandable when they're suffering the brunt of the persecution. Uh, finally, after a couple days of, of Doctors Without Borders being completely disallowed from operating in the country, the government changed its stance and said, okay, we will allow, allow you to come back and, and do your projects in most of the country, but still in Arakan State, where the majority of Muslim people are who need the assistance, it's, it's out of bounds for, for the organization. Also, the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights, Tomas Quintana, who is uh, just on his, on his way out, he's finishing his term with the UN, uh, he was unable to complete his final investigation in Arakan State because of so many protests against, against him and his, his fact-finding mission. Um, and, and just in the past couple days, it was announced that, the, that President Ben Singh has sent draft laws to Parliament that would restrict, that would further restrict uh, marriage marriage, liberties, and, and freedom of travel for, for Muslims in the country. Um, so these, these are mostly laws that have been suggested and are being encouraged by, by what I would call 
chauvinist Buddhists, um, but now the, the president is encouraging the parliament to, to draft the laws for, for, for further debate. So this is something that we're going to, con unfortunately, continue to see as we look into the future. And so now I would like to, I'm not sure of the time. Okay, we have a couple more minutes. Um, I want to talk, talk about some issues that, that right now are variables. We can't quite say yet whether they, they are going to be uh, positive or negatives for the country, but they're definitely some of the major issues that we will see throughout the rest of this year and next year before the, the, the next national elections in 2015. And they are the continued uh, dichotomy between press freedom and responsibility of the press and also the, the lingering effects of nationalist, di dictatorial, and xenophobic mentality that we've seen expressed uh, through state policy and through those in positions of power, even though the, you know, Burma is, is now a semi-civilian-led government, there's still ex uh, indications that, that uh, a lot of those in power still have these persistent uh, nationalist mentality, um, and also, as I mentioned, the the continuation of development projects and the detrimental effects on the environment, the, the question of how the benefits from these projects will be distributed, and also the protection of land ownership and and compensation for people who are who are relocated or suffer because of these projects. And Alex, as I mentioned, is going to cover this a bit more in his presentation. Also, another another big issue in the news about Burma right now is the is the uh, efforts to amend the 2008 constitution. I, I explained at the beginning that in order for amendments to be made, it requires a supermajority of 75 percent of the parliament's voting in favor of the amendment. This is significant because currently there's a clause in the constitution 59F that bars Aung San Suu Kyi from becoming president. Specifically, it, it says anybody who has a foreign spouse or who has children who are nationals of a foreign country are barred from the presidency, but many believe that this was specifically put in the Constitution to bar her. Um, I encountered, part, part of what I would describe as the, as the, the positive change in atmosphere in the country is uh, in 2010, we had to, I had to find ways to broach the subject of politics and, and local people's opinions and ideas about the political situation in the country very carefully. In 2014, it was much more often local people, uh, local people in, inside the country coming up to me and wanting to share their opinions and asking me my opinion. Um, I, the, pretty much everybody agrees that if Aung San Suu Kyi is allowed to run for president in the next year, she, she would win even though she has seen a bit of uh, controversy and, and a bit of a loss of credibility among, among the population, she would, she would still probably carry the election. But uh, it's a question of whether the Constitution can be amended in time to allow for that. And there's also a question of that's, that's interesting to, to discuss is, would she even be an effective leader of the country? Uh, this is something that's being being discussed and debated inside and out the country. Should she even run? Is there a more effective use for her talents and her skills than, than stepping into the quagmire of the presidency? Some of the, the major arguments is that her party, the National League for Democracy, is is relatively untested, although it, it does have it does carry the, the support of the majority of the of the population, as has been evidenced through previous elections, it is, it's a party that hasn't been allowed to, to gain much experience in, in administration. Also, there are uh, questions about the, the suitability of the National League for Democracy in terms of a perceived lack of, in, of, lack of input from ethnic and, and younger generations. It's a, a definitely a Burman-centered uh, and dominated party. 
and, and besides the National League for Democracy lacking experience, also Aung San Suu Kyi, although she has been the leader of the party for over 20 years, she was under house arrest for, for 15 of those years and, and doesn't have much proven administration, administrative uh, experience. Also, it's been disappointing to many that she's been mostly silent on, on some of the major, major conflicts in the country since she became a member of parliament in 2012. Rather than taking a principled stand on the, the uh, Buddhist-Muslim conflict, she's mostly chosen a, a very pragmatic stance where it seems, rather than, than pushing for an end to the conflict, uh, she's more interested in just not offending anybody. So this, is, this has been worrying. And there's also questions about Aung San Suu Kyi's relationship with the military. Um, we've, we've seen that even Ben Sain, a, a former general, seems to have difficulty sometimes controlling the military. And there's questions of, of how an Aung San Suu Kyi-led administration would, would work with the country's military. So this is, these, are, these are issues that are, that are going to continue to be discussed and need to be uh, debated by, by people inside the country as we move forward to the next election next year. So I want to end, we, I'm, I'm happy that we have a couple of presentations today talking about refugees and migrants from Burma. Specific, most of my work related to Burma has been with migrants in Chiang Mai, migrants from the country. And so I'd just like to end, because this is a question that, that comes up often, People ask, with all the changes in Burma, you know, we're, we're reading about there's there's less conflict, more ceasefires are being signed, less human rights abuses. Are the refugee camps going to be closed, and are the are the migrants going to be home, or are the migrants going to be going home? Maybe organizations like Burma Study Center and other other organizations serving refugee and migrant populations in Thailand are going to soon be unnecessary. And my answer to that is that last year, last year, the fact is is that less than 2% of registered refugees from Burma re returned home voluntarily. So obviously, this uh, demonstrates that there is still a, a lot of skepticism and a mistrustful attitude on the, on the part of migrants and refugees about whether or not it's, it's safe to return home. And I think that it's very understandable that they would be wary and, and skeptical after seeing many generations of their families suffering under military dictatorship. Even if we, even if we can say, yes, there has been a, a short period of a positive change in Burma. Yes? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, even though there has been a, a in the past couple of years, there has been less conflict in the country. It's, it's understandable that if you are a refugee who has seen your, your village destroyed and, and heard from previous generations in your family how they were mistreated and displaced by the, by the Burmese military, that you would be wary about going home. Also, as I, as I pointed out, although there have been significant changes in the country, and they are mostly mostly just apparent in the major cities and the urban areas, and little has changed on the ground in rural and ethnic areas. Uh, and if you, if you talk to, as I, as I have, with uh, migrants in Chiang Mai, who are mostly from, from eastern Burma, the, the, about whether they're considering going home or whether they think it's going to be possible for them to return to their, their land in the near future, the two most uh, common responses that I hear are, one, that is that uh, just not enough time has passed yet. They want to make sure that the reforms aren't going to be to be rolled back and that the country slips backwards. Uh, there needs to be a little bit more time of, of positive reform before they, they feel confident in returning home. And the other response that I that I hear frequently is that although there there has been a positive change for the overall economy in the country due to an influx of, of investment and the lifting of international sanctions. Uh, even as illegal and undocumented migrant laborers, it's much easier for people from Burma to make, to earn higher wages and support their families back home by working in Thailand than, than if they went back home. So they're, they're by and large not, not ready to return home yet, although we're going to hear from Saw Nepal 
about some of the pressures that are being put on them to, to leave the refugee camps and to return back to Burma. It would certainly be a, a publicity coup for the new government if they can say, now it's the country is, is welcoming and, and it's safe and stable enough for all exiles to return back. Uh, refugee camps in Thailand are unnecessary. Everybody can return home. Although they would, they would love to to make that announcement, it's just it just doesn't look like it's going to be the reality too soon. And so, because of all this, I would like to encourage uh, members of the international community to remember that it's still very important to support support organizations that are able to provide access to education, health, and social welfare services for migrants and refugees, because the population still exists. And that is the, the end of my presentation. So if we have a, a couple more minutes before our first coffee break. So I'm eager to, to know if you have any questions or to have some dialogue. Yes? Uh, Mark Pence, I have a question. You talk about people doing individual travel. Now I think that's what a lot of people would like to do. They have a very romantic view that they can get a backpack and they can just wander in Burma. How practical is that? I said, hey, let's go tomorrow to Burma. Is that a good idea or not a good idea? Well, it's, it's certainly not a question of... Okay, the question is about is it practical to encourage individual travelers or backpackers to, to enter the country? Um, I, it's certainly not a question of whether it's possible. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not difficult even for people who've formerly been deported from the country to now get a visa to, to travel quite freely. Uh, as I think that I would reiterate that traveling on your own and making your own arrangements does does require a little bit more effort, and you're likely to, to experience more inconveniences. But I think that, especially if you're if you're looking for an authentic travel experience and experiencing the true culture and, and being able to interact with the local people, it's to your advantage. And I think that it's the there's an ethical consideration about whether you want to give the majority of your money to large hotels and restaurants and tour operators that, that are already well established and are doing quite well for themselves, or if you want your tourist dollars to support the people that really need every every last job. Yes. So if I go to Burma, can I go anywhere else? No. Okay, the, the question is if if he goes if somebody goes to Burma, can he go anywhere without restrictions? And no, there's still a number of, of black areas where it's, it's impossible to travel. In just the past couple months, it seems that, that uh, some, of the, some of the areas in the country that were, were off limits for tourists in, in the past have, be, have begun opening up. But there's still large majorities, not large, large areas of the country where tourists are not allowed. Um, it's, I, I remember in, in my hotel in Regina, there was a, a large poster in the lobby that, that classified areas where tourists were allowed to go, areas where you needed to get permission in advance if you wanted to visit, and then areas where it was strictly off limits and if you were found in those areas you would be subject to arrest and deportation. So uh, some of this is because there are there's still ongoing conflicts between the ethnic, ethnic armed groups and the national military and, uh, and uh, other, other reasons might be that it's, it's because it's where, for example, there might be secret chemical weapons factories where they don't want international journalists or tourists poking around, um, but there's still definitely large areas of the country where, where you're not allowed to go. Ajahn yeah. Chiang has a question? No, Okay. Okay. Let's let's just do a couple more questions and then I'll hand it over to Ajahn Chayan. Yes. Sorry, maybe it's not a question, just uh, sharing. Good. Um, we see that presentation that uh, negative after after the reform of the election, the negative and positive. Uh, here, I would like to put a little bit more about the, the negative and the positive. And it is because do you want to come up? So, um, 
apologize, my English is very poor, but I will try my best. Uh, here I, I received a presentation, it's very good, that uh, showing us the positive and negative. So here I would like to add more, maybe a little bit as my experience. Um, like uh, we see that uh, the change, uh, the po positive, I, I can say that it's very little that uh, the Burmese government has uh, created a change in Burma, right? Uh, because what I can say that even those that they, they have been, uh, they have they make a change, like uh, for example, they have a ceasefire agreement with uh, the armed uh, revolution armed groups or uh, uh, other things. So that like uh, they release the political political prisoners, and uh, it is it is show it is uh, only show the Burmese government are more are uh, good now. So the international community said, oh, now Burma has changed in a, in a positive way. So you can see that after that, uh, people like ADB or other governments put a lot of money in Burma. They, they loan a lot of money to, to the Burmese government. And always Burmese government are talking about uh, development. But on the other hand, the development is in becoming a lot of negative. See that like uh, you can see that uh, land grabbing, uh, other other project like uh, where deep sea port is all are coming after the, the reform. So you can see like a uh, pipelines. So you can see that it, it is it is uh, will cause a lot of problem for the community for the for the people. It's not it's not benefit to the to the people of, of Burm the Burmese people or the ethnic people. Like uh, uh, like the release of San Suu so they got many things. Like I said, then uh, like I said, the the the, the release of the section has been gone. So all is uh, their goals. But see that in the in the, uh, in the people of Burma or in the, uh, the ethnic groups, nothing. They don't get nothing. They only get for more. They will get more burden. They will get more problem, like like um, land confiscation or armies. Uh, this this one. See, like uh, always, the the ethnic groups has called for uh, uh, okay, uh, to reduce the military in the areas because uh, the problem of Burma is not an economic problem. It is. Uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic conflict or civil war. That is a problem. That is the main problem. If they don't uh, resolve this problem and the uh, and the, the the problem of the civil war in Burma keep will be keep going on. This problem will, will never be stopped. So now the government has solved the problem. Is they are not in the channel. They, they, they are seeing the real problem is. They should, uh, they should be solved, but they know they never. Like I said, that the the, the, uh, the civil war problem, it's a big problem. So that, uh, uh, like always, the uh, the ethnic arms group has called for uh, uh, to stop fighting, like uh, like Kachin state, stay are fighting now, or Shan state, stay are fighting, and they this they keep uh moving the army more and more in the in the ethnic areas. So even though very little bit changed, but the real things are not changed. Like in Korean and the, with the Korean groups, they have signed the uh, temporary agreement ceasefires. But on the other hand, they they remove they move the army more and more in the Korean Korean state in the in the in the Korean control and SAP and you control it. And uh, uh, they reconstructed the, the post in the concrete. So that is also we can see that nothing has been changed. Even though it's not the IDP, so many people are called, uh, say that international people say that okay, so the uh, the refugee can go back, but the IDP has, they cannot go back to the village yet. So. For the refugee, it's very far, see? So like that. Uh, even those like uh, the, the current people, if every every groups of the arms group has called for court of conduct uh, for 
for the, between the military, the Burmese military and the ethnic armed military. Court of Court in this said, the Burmese government should reduce the, not withdraw, just reduce the army, post or army for, in, the, in the control area. As the, for the refugee or for the IDP can go back and work in the, their own, own land. But they don't. Court of Court is they keep, keep quiet. They never re respond. So the, on the other, as I said, they, they, they move more army in the area. So that is a big challenge. Yes. So I can say that everything, is, all the change is only Burmese government gets their benefit, not for the people of Burma or for the ethnic people receiving any benefits. So we can say that nothing has been changed on the ground. I'm not a case you I mean, I share, it, I share my experience and uh, also uh, and that. And also just only in the, within in the beginning of this year, even though they are, share, and they are signing the ceasefire, but they start they sharing the, 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 the big arms, they are sharing in the village, share, share. They, they shoot in, uh, I don't know, I don't know. the Burmese army are sharing the weapon, share, share, share the weapon in the village. Shell. 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 Yes, water, water, and they they also shoot the villager when they go in and uh, find the fish in the river. Just this year, here in the beginning of January, February, something like that. Yeah. So you can see some some area like the current control, they start keeping fighting, the very small Garuda or something like that. Kachin and Shan are always fighting. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of your points. I, I agree that the changes in Burma that have happened since 2010 have, by and large, greatly benefited those in power much more than, than the local people and ethnic people on the ground. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that today we're able to have several presentations going more in depth about, about most of the issues that I, that I touched on here. Uh, so we can we can have a discussion of, of different views. Um, we're we're going we're scheduled to take a coffee break before our next presentation. But is there one more point or question somebody would like to to raise at this time? Okay, so I will. I just want to to mention for those of you who are today's session, which is all focused on presentations and discussions about Burma, is open for the public. So there's many people here who aren't uh, part of the, the main dignity and humil uh, dignity, Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies Conference. So I just want to briefly let you know that uh, my presentation that, that we just uh, completed was sort of an overview of, of changes. And then there's five more presentations today that will be going more in depth. Uh, after our brief coffee break, Alex from Burma Partnership is going to talk about the, the continuing conflict between ethnic armed groups and the national military and also prospects for national reconciliation. Then Jeff Warner is going to be presenting his work with a Burmese migrant community in Thailand. After lunch, Saw Nepal will talk more about refugees and repatriation issues. And Following that will be Akarat Sabu, who's going to give us more insight about the Rohingya conflict that I briefly touched on. And finally, representatives from We Women Foundation will talk about issues affecting women in Burma and, and women from Burma who are in Thailand. So let's meet back here in about 15 minutes for the next presentation.